It's often said that one should judge a culture not only by its actions, but also its entertainment. The Roman Colosseums were decried for their brutality, the 19th century minstrel shows for their blatant racism, but we also quote a 400-year-old English playwright to this day, and watch black and white movies that, despite their age, elicit emotional responses. There are distractions we've done since we first projected silhouettes onto cave walls. Realities within reality, consistent to only their own rules, where artificial scenarios generate response in the audience. Sometimes that reaction is horrified disgust or shock, but when it's done best, it elevates the experience to new heights, giving a dopamine rush akin to drug use. Euphoric highs and brutal lows, that's what keeps the human brain coming back for more. No medium exploits this better than television, where the essential premise of each show is easily understood, but the crew takes it in every imaginable direction. For better or for worse. Sometimes way worse. Yeah. Respect the fairies next time, True Blood. However, when a series gathers the perfect storm of topical, talented, and truly gut wrenching, you get award winning drama, such as Showtime's roller coaster called Homeland, and the Netflix golden child House of Cards. Both know their subject matter through and through, but by no means tie themselves to the constraints of reality or due process. They deal with fear and how people react, or at times overreact, to it. So which does a better job of portraying what fear will drive people to do? Let's find out as we follow a few people on very different quests. Meet Carrie Matheson and Frank Underwood, two people you can't compare. Oh. Well then we also have Nick Brody and Zoe Barnes. Oh! Much better. Carrie is certain that Nick has a secret agenda after being brought back to the US, and Zoe knows that Frank must have use for someone in the press. I'm sticking with the events of the first seasons, as they show the best use of the hidden threat that's growing while the populace at large stays in the dark about the danger. There's a lot to talk about too, from a Richard III rise to power, to a hidden terror plot that could threaten the nation, and both are in their infancy, where a lot of people are in disbelief that anything could go wrong, but a few people are aware of how dangerous this could be. I really should have picked a different year to talk about these. Let's start with the terror. Nick Brody was discovered after armed forces raided a Middle Eastern stronghold, the rare American soldier held captive by terrorists. He was assumed dead, but apparently was just held hostage for eight years. Of course, a few months before he emerged, CIA agent Carrie was told by her informant one cryptic line. An American has been turned. Like another famous agent, she doesn't believe in coincidences. Nope. So begins the game of cat and mouse, where actor Claire Dane spends half the first season intensely staring at computer monitors. You see, she wants to watch his every move, waiting for that moment when he makes contact with the terrorists, because she knows it's only going to happen once, so she spends every waking hour observing his actions. All of them. It gets weirder, believe it or not, but the House of Cards dynamic is much more believable. Zoe is a fledgling journalist who just is looking for that story to take her career to the next level. And when this gets emailed to her, taken outside the opera she was attending, instead of going to TMZ, she goes directly to the source. It is after 10.30 at night and this is my home. I do not allow We're any- We're part of a mutual admiration society. You're a fan of the symphony. Well, more for the people watching than the music. As we know, all successful partnerships start with blackmail. She discovers Frank's real intention rather quickly, to destroy those who made him a false promise of power. You see, Frank kind of has a thing for that. Money is the McMansion in Sarasota that starts falling apart after 10 years. Power is the old stone building that stands for centuries. I cannot respect someone who doesn't see the difference. I did mention Richard III, right? Because there's a whole lot of fourth wall breaking in this first season. Unlike the introspective Brody, who the audience can watch the actions of but only guess at the inner workings, House of Cards viewers are in on the plots from inception to completion. It's like being the devil's personal assistant as we're along for the rise of a truly despicable man who's living his own American dream. That's a major tone difference. House of Cards plays to the religion of me, where every character is either self-centered or a naive pawn in a chess game of power. The Homeland, on the other hand, has the cause to die for, where each character is willing to do whatever it takes to make sure something happens or doesn't happen. It's kind of weird. Brody is that unstoppable force, and Carrie wants to be that immovable object. He wants to make sure he's going to right this cause that he suddenly becomes sympathetic to, and she wants to make sure 9-11 will never happen again. 
Homeland plays a lot more desperate for that reason. Because the causes are so much bigger than one person's MO, Homeland generates a helpless feeling, where people are just cogs and machinations beyond their control. Perhaps that's why Claire always seems to be overreacting to situations. Or maybe she's off her meds again. Who knows? House of Cards is a more free feeling, where all these terrible people are using everyone in their path to maximum advantage. So, I guess the difference is really perspective. It's a management versus employee argument. People perceive management as the end-all solution. They're the problem solvers, the ones who are supposed to get things done. While that's certainly their title and responsibility, individuals not empowered will always have the agency to act how they see fit, if they're willing to deal with the consequences of acting without proper authority. Hell, <laughs> that last one is the bread and butter of Carrie Matheson's entire career. No one quite exemplifies that lack of control and power of agency better than the House of Cards character, Peter Russo. He's actually such an integral part of Frank's rise to power, I shouldn't examine him alone. DM? This is a situation you do not wish to acknowledge. Or you are not aware of the caliber of disaster. DM? Well, you got trouble, my friend. I'd be very pissed if Mighty Pounds always Mighty Pounds to say it. I guess you're not the hour. Socio. Hey, who are you? Oh, don't play coy with me. Come on now, you've known me for a long time. I'm the storyteller. I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> of course you do. Come on, you remember. Oh, yeah, DM told me about you. You're a sub. Yes, he's on sabbatical. That's why I'm here to fill in for him. <laughs> so what do you want to know about Peter Russo? Have you been spying on me? Like I need to spy, I just know. So let's talk cards. Peter Russo, a man who curried favor with the right voting block so he could play politician for a while. And he did such a great job. I mean, he enjoys his blow, booze, and beautiful women as much as the next man. His problem, though, was with moderation, and that I gotta fault him on. He's on the fast track to a short congressional career. Yeah, I mean, the man's problem with moderation, plus the amount of exposure he gets as a congressman. <laughs> Those little escapades land him exactly where you think. License and registration. Uh, the glove compartment, sweetheart. This isn't your driver's license, it's a Starbucks card. <laughs> So have you been drinking? No, I never drink coffee at this hour. So if he's such a liability, why would Frank choose him to have in his pocket? That's just inviting trouble. Yes, that's true. If you were officially on Frank's team. See, that's not exactly their arrangement. Your absolute, unquestioning loyalty. Always. Do not misunderstand what I mean by loyalty. Anything. Name it, Frank. You seem far too relaxed. I'm not. You shouldn't be. And Patsy was his name oh. Do you need someone to do the dirty work and disavow? Call Patsy. Want a puppet in power you can destroy at a moment's notice? That's Patsy! Peter is the perfect choice for that. It is a fantastic illustration. How these people are just pawns to Frank to be discarded at a moment's notice. Right after my own heart. It, that's unnerving. You really have to admire a man who can take control of the situation no matter how chaotic it gets. That's what being a role player, and more specifically, a storyteller, is all about. Fair enough. Thanks for highlighting that, storyteller. I'll be here. Don't be a stranger. Strange that the DM didn't talk about him more. Seems like a nice guy. Homeland also has its own major plot moving player, but of the total opposite variety. He's a big bad that's so menacing he's spoken of only in whispers at upper level intelligence, chased like a ghost of a shadow for years. The captor, the converter, the conniving, Abu Nazir. Honestly, this is the part that rubs viewers the wrong way sometimes, because he's built as such an untouchable menace, pulling all the strings, and that kind of tests the suspension of disbelief. Stop right there! Been a while since I've heard that one. How you been, Dick? Not bad, just revising my hostile takeover. It's gonna be a little more difficult if they pass that anti-drone legislation. Right. So why'd you stop me? Don't you realize what Abu Nazir is? 
The stereotypical terrorist mastermind that damages the image of Arabs to this day. A blank check. Wait, what? Terrorists hijacked some planes and struck the World Trade Center on September 11th, 2001. In that instant, vague notions against terrorism were no more. Congress enacted the Patriot Act and war began, continuing for more than a decade. Yeah, we're all well aware of that. Did you know that before this, Americans pushing around the Middle Eastern countries was viewed as bullying internationally? Due to some minor confrontation in the 50s where Britain and the U.S. may have displaced a leader to replace it with one more accommodating to Western nations. I think I remember that from school. But who remembers that in the wake of 9-11? Extreme action should be met with extreme reaction. And that's a war we can all get behind. If we have a figure like Abu Nazir, totally evil in our way of thinking, completely untouchable, then we just have to spend more and more resources to stop him. At the time of the first season of Homeland, he hadn't yet committed a direct attack against the United States. The government just knew it was coming and wanted to stop it before it happened. With presences like Abu Nazir out in the world, there's always money for government forces. Always a reason to be prepared for the worst. And not only that, they can expand their powers on a daily basis, without anyone betting an eye, because they're just keeping their people safe. I really wish I had a good argument for that statement. That's what life in fear really means. Willing to pay endless amounts to protect yourself from something that might happen. Give up any civil liberties because, well, the terrorists aren't going to win this one. Thanks for depressing me, Dick. Anytime. I'll be watching. Of course you will be. So both shows have mastered their own brands of fear and manipulation. Zoe is afraid that if she stops reporting exactly what Frank wants, she's going to lose her story, her inside source. And Carrie, she's afraid that if she doesn't do exactly what she's been told not to, the country is going to suffer for it. And you know what? Wait. Fear is a weird thing. Collective fear even more so. When I was talking with Dick just now, I was thinking, man, this video is going to get pulled if that's left in. But why? He was just citing sources and giving his opinion. Sources, by the way, that are all publicly available, part of the history books. So why should we be afraid to discuss something that's the truth? That's really what these shows do best, to make people question, why am I afraid of this? Statistically, the number of people that died to terrorism plots are far outweighed by vehicular accidents and even vending machines. The policy changes that someone like Frank Underwood could enact in the law might do more harm, but still, not even close compared to our road casualty rate. Being afraid of what could happen, be it a terrorist attack or people in power making selfish choices, won't change the fact that we have no guarantees beyond this moment. We are alive right now, and that's all we know we're going to get. Should we be afraid of someone threatening to take that away from us? No. Be aware, be proactive to prevent, but never fearful. Throughout history, civilizations have had its citizens threatened, both by outside influences or internal corruption. Both of these use fear to get their way, and it only works if its people choose to let fear rule their actions. If we refuse to think with fear, and instead use our minds to recognize when a threat is present, we are several steps ahead of the panic-stricken mobs that only know destruction. We can recognize and even repel influences that would make our lives worse. It's not easy, especially with so much information and so many unknown people out there. But trust yourself, read your situations, and fear is much easier to see through. House of Cards and Homeland are both great shows that masterfully use intimidation, subterfuge, and secrecy to scare not only people in their universes, but some of its audience members. Fear will only rule us if we let it. I'm Socio, and this was a far different video than I thought it would be. Having to revise my hostile takeover, it's going to be very difficult if they pass that anti-drone legislation. Legislation. Ruh-roh.